Hi, I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for week number 51 of Live with Annie. It's always a treat to see you, and we're happy today to be able to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We hope you have a wonderful holiday and the best New Year ever. How's your holiday sewing going? Is your machine still worrying? Or have you progressed to wrapping while you sip eggnog and watch cheesy Christmas movies? Or are you all done with it all and just sitting around enjoying the time? I have to confess that I'm a long way from being ready for the holiday. My sister is here for a few weeks and she came with a long list of sewing that she wanted to do. So we have making, been making all kinds of projects. I've mostly been busy cutting and supervising, so not much sewing is happening on my part. Though I did manage to finish a couple of projects by sewing till 1 a.m. the past two nights. I'm hoping to correct that while we're close next week, as I have some ideas for new patterns that I really want to play with, so I'm going to try really hard to make some time then to work on those. Wish me luck! Last week we showcased No Sew, Unisex, One Size Fits All gifts that any maker will love. We featured a dozen of my favorite tools for bag making, as well as some tips for projects to store them. If you missed it or want to watch it again, remember that all of the episodes of Live with Annie are available online. You can watch them on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel, or by going to byannie.com live. We'll put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. To thank everyone for joining us last week, we had two fun giveaways. Each winner received a By Annie stiletto and pressing tool and the quick zip case pattern. That pattern includes instructions for quick and easy cases in two sizes, and both are perfect for carrying a stiletto and more. Lucky winners were Jean Johnson and Stephanie Hardy. We can't wait to send these prizes to you both. Since next week is the last Wednesday in 2021, we're planning a special end of the year episode. It's going to be a lot of fun, so be sure to join us then. Because of that, we've moved our normal month-end tips, tricks, and techniques episode up to this week. So today we're going to focus on a few questions that we've received over the past month. We'll talk about soft and stable, measurements in biani patterns, adapting other patterns to use biani techniques, alternatives for the closure on the glow-and-go wrap, and how to install a zipper on the deep pocket in Travel Essentials. We have got lots to cover, so let's get started. We recently received an email from a customer who had purchased another brand of foam stabilizer, but she'd seen Soft and Stable too, and she wanted to know how the two products compared. As the creator of Soft and Stable, the original foam stabilizer, you can imagine that I am more than a little biased to Soft and Stable, so I was happy to share my thoughts. I'm going to grab a little bit of stuff here to put up on the table. So when I created Soft and Stable over 10 years ago, my goal was to develop a stabilizer that would give body and stability to projects without adding a lot of weight. I wanted a purse or a bag that would stand up and hold its shape without having to use a lot of other interfacings and stabilizers. I also wanted something that would be machine washable and dryable and easy to use. At the core of Soft and Stable is a firm but resilient foam, and we feel that Soft and Stable has the very best quality foam of all foam stabilizers on the market today. Soft and Stable has very little stretch, and it really makes your project stand up and hold its shape. You can wad it up in a ball and it bounces right back into shape. If it or your project gets wrinkled or has creases from being folded, just hit it with a bit of steam using an iron set on medium heat. Those wrinkles will disappear like magic. When you quilt your fabric to the soft and stable, you end up with a flat, even piece. 
Before I developed Soft and Stable, I used headliner foam, which is a much lower quality foam. And no matter how careful I was to keep the fabric smooth against the foam, the fabrics would move and the foam would stretch and I'd end up with a quilted piece that looked like a boat when I was done. It would be very difficult, if not impossible, to sew directly to the foam because your fabric slides around and the foam sticks to the feed dogs and then it won't move. I also learned that when working with headliner foam. So we added a softly napped fabric to each side of the foam. So each side has that lining fabric on it. And that lining fabric is laminated to the foam using a unique flame lamination process. So there aren't any glues or other adhesives to gum up your needle. As with the foam, we feel that the napped fabric we use for soft and stable is the very best on the market. It really hugs your fabric and acts almost like a magnet to keep it in place. This is going to give you a really smooth finish on both quilted and non-quilted pieces, and it yields a really beautiful long-term result, even after multiple washings. Other products on the market use fabrics that have less nap, as well as fabrics that fray easily, and some may attach them using other processes. Unlike some other foam stabilizers on the market, Soft and Stable is a sew-in interfacing. It is not fusible. We avoid fusibles because they can cause wrinkles and bubbles in the fabric, both during the fusing process and as the product is assembled and used. Here's an example of a piece of fabric that has been washed once after it was fused to a competing brand of fusible foam. As you can see, there are lots of bubbles and wrinkles. I always say that it looks like my thighs. With soft and stable, you can avoid that dreaded cellulite look. So to do it, all you're going to do is smooth your fabrics onto the soft and stable, pin the layers together, and then join them by sewing around the edges or quilting through the layers. Your fabric clings really easily to the softly napped fabric that's laminated to each side of the foam. So it's extra easy to sew and quilt. The other important thing to note about soft and stable is that it's 58 to 60 inches wide. Some of the other foam interfacings on the market are only 20 inches wide. So that's a really important factor, not only when you compare prices, but also when you consider the most efficient use of materials for larger projects. We love using Soft and Stable to easily provide body instability to our projects. And here's an example of a set of on-the-town bags that I made to demonstrate the beauty of Soft and Stable. So if you look at these, this one is made with Soft and Stable. This one's made with batting. Probably even from where you are on the screen, you can see that the one that is made with Soft and Stable has a much more smooth, um, clean appearance. The one that's made with um, batting is a lot more wrinkly. I had to actually quilt the fabric every three inches to get it to go together because you can't go that far apart without sewing your fabric to your batting. On the soft and stable, there, it's just sewn around the outside edges. Where you're especially going to notice the difference is when I let go of these heavy wooden handles. And the, the handles on the bag that's made with batting cause the whole bag to just collapse. It doesn't stand up and hold its shape because it just has that batting inside. The one that I make with soft and stable stands up and holds its shape, which makes it easy when I'm ready to access something in my purse to open it and get what I need out of it. So that's the real advantage that you have with soft and stable um, for your projects. It gives them great body instability and makes it worth all the work that you put into them. So if you want some more info about Soft and Stable, we talked about its features, how it was developed, and how to use it way back in week number two of our Facebook Lives. And you again, you can find that by going to byannie.com slash live. Scroll down on the page and then use the little drop down menu that's under the past episodes to find week two Soft and Stable. I'm going to grab a quick drink.
And if you're just joining us today, we're sharing tips, tricks, and techniques and answering questions that come in have come in over the past month. So we just talked about why you want to use Biani Soft and Stable in your project. Let's talk next about how measurements are listed in Biani patterns. We occasionally will receive questions from customers who are confused by how measurements are listed. So I want to take a few minutes to discuss how and why we write measurements as we do. When we began working with a professional graphic designer over five years ago, we came out with a new layout and design for our patterns, and that included developing a standard style. One of the standards involved how measurements would be listed in our patterns. And as our graphic designer Lindsay told us, some patterns choose to list measurements as height by width, others pick width by height. She said, either one works, there's no right or wrong, just pick one and stick with it going forward. So after lots of discussion and thought, we decided that the Biani style standard going forward would be to list pattern measurements as height by width. And so I wanted to um, explain what the difference is between height and width. So here's a beautiful piece of fabric and pretend that this is on a bolt and you're at the store getting ready to buy it. So height is the lengthwise grain of the fabric and that runs parallel to the selvages. So you've got your selvages here on, your, on the side and parallel to that is the height measurement. Width is the crosswise grain and that's the one that has the selvages on each side. So this is the height, this would be the width. So most Biani patterns, including all the ones that were written in at least the past five years, use that standard and they also include a note to that effect that's right at the top of the cutting instructions. Please be aware though that some of our older patterns may have a different standard, so make sure you read the pattern carefully before you start. If it's hard for you to understand which is height and which is width, here's a way that might be helpful for you on how to think about it. Think about how you buy fabric. So when we talk about fabrics, we refer to the measurements from selvage to selvage as the width. So for instance, most quilting cotton fabrics are 42 to 44 inches wide. If you happen to cut off the selvages on your piece, you can also tell which is the width by looking at the crosswise grain. So the crosswise grain is a little bit more stretchy and you can test that to know which is the width. The length is the measurement of the fabric as it comes off the bolt. My arms aren't quite long enough to straighten that out. So again, the lengthwise grain is going up and down and that's the one that has very little stretch. Part of the reason that we decided to go height by width is that height is usually the first number that you say. For instance, a painter might say, cut a two inch strip. In that case, two inches is the height, the width is 42 to 44 inches. We're assuming it's across the fabric. Or when buying fabric, you go in and say, I'd like a yard of fabric. Once cut, that piece is going to measure 36 by 42 to 44. So again, 36 is the height, 44 is the width. So I hope that explanation helps you understand how we list measurements. And as always, if you have any questions when you're working on a pattern, be sure to contact us before you cut. This is a new fabric from Free Spirit by Katie Pasquini Massapost called Game Day. And I haven't decided yet what we're going to make with it, but I think it would make a very fun bag. All right, let's talk next about some measurements in some of our older patterns, um, in particular ones that were written before 2016 when we went to our new standard. So Natalie recently sent us an email and she was questioning the dimensions that were listed in Justice, just in case. And she noted that the instructions said that their measurements were listed as height, which is the lengthwise grain, by width, which is the crosswise grain, but she was confused by the fact that the cutting instructions said to cut a 9 by 16 inch piece for the small case, but the drawings for the assembly of the project showed pieces that were taller than they were wide. 
and I had to give Natalie an apology as well as an explanation because I could definitely see why she was confused. And anyone who is making something from our older patterns will probably benefit from this explanation. So just in case is one of my older patterns, and we and others have successfully made lots and lots of these handy little cases. They're one of my go-to gifts for guys. But the pattern was written before we had established standards and before I had a team of pattern testers or tech editors who were checking and double-checking everything. And in those days, I primarily used non-directional fabrics, and making the very best use of fabric was of really great importance to me. So for the just-in-case pattern, I designed the cutting instructions so that all the pieces could be cut from fat quarters. And I assumed that the maker, like me, would be using non-directional fabrics. In fact, there is a note on the back of the pattern that says to avoid directional fabrics until you understand the process, as you might need more fabric in different methods if you're using a directional fabric. In my defense, though the small bag that's pictured on the cover has the magnetic closure showing at the top, there's really no reason why you couldn't consider that the side, as is shown on the open larger case that's at the bottom on the cover. So even if you were using directional fabric, I think that cutting that way would work. However, as I told Natalie, technically she was right. Those people should be turned the other way in order to match the assembly instructions that follow. And if you are using a directional fabric and want this to be the top of your design, that is what I would recommend. Just know that then you won't be able to get the pieces for the large case out of a fat quarter. So to explain that a little bit further, I've got three examples of bags that I want to show. So again, this set of just-in-case was made by cutting the fabric as directed in the pattern. And again, because it's a non-directional fabric, cutting the pieces with this as the height and this as the width works fine. So unless your fabric is directional, I just cut the way the pattern recommends and then rotate the pieces so that they are taller than they are wide when you begin the assembly process so they match the pictures that are in, are in the pattern. On this case, we used a directional fabric. So on this one, we made sure that when we cut the body, this was our height and this was our width. In reality, we probably should have cut this body into two pieces and rotate them, rotated them so that the elephants were right side up on both sides. Uh, but we didn't think about that, obviously, and, and really having those upside down elephants on the back doesn't bother me at all. If you're using a directional fabric and you want to avoid the upside down elephants on the back, be sure to check out our Using Directional Fabrics video, uh, which you can find either on our tutorials page or in our di your digital library for some more information on that. All right, so here's a set that um, we cut as directed in the pattern. And on this one, my staff said, this is, the, this is the top and this is the side. So this one we cut just exactly as the pattern had it, and we decided that the opening on these were on the side. So we did that on both the small and on the large. If I made this case again, because to me this is the front, this is the back, I would turn this pocket so that it opens at the top rather than opening at the bottom as it does here. You know, if you're considering um, this the top, it doesn't really matter, but it kind of depends on how you're going to use it. So that's something that you might want to consider if you're making a just-in-case. All I have to say is that when you have directional fabrics, it really complicates pattern writing instructions. And just-in-case is a pattern that I really would love to update, as partly so we can film an add-on video for it. When we do, I'm going to be sure to address the measurement issue and also include some more instructions about how to deal with directional fabrics. Needless to say, I really wish I could just snap my fingers and have all those things done, uh, but there's just not enough hours in the day to make everything happen as quickly as I like. So for now, we have just posted a note on the corrections page on our website that says, cutting instructions for the case body pieces 
are designed to make best use of fabric and will be rotated to be taller than wide when assembled. So as always, we recommend that you check that corrections page before you begin cutting on any pattern. So that is some tips about cutting your pieces for just in case. If you're just joining us today, we're talking about tips, tricks, and techniques. We're answering questions that came in over the past month. We've talked about why you want to use soft and stable in your project and how measurements are listed in most by any patterns. Let's talk next about how to adapt patterns from other designers to use by any techniques. So earlier this month, we received an email from Annie M who had questions about altering patterns by other designers to use by Annie techniques. Annie was primarily interested in adapting a pattern to eliminate the loose linings. She said that she'd prefer to use by Annie techniques to quilt the fabric and then use bindings to cover the raw edges. And her question was about how to install pockets without the stitches showing on the other side of the bag. When I started designing patterns for purses and bags over 20 years ago, I realized early on that I did not like bags with loose linings. I don't like the way the fabric moves around inside the bag or the fact that the linings can be baggy and wrinkly. I found that I much preferred a bag made with quilted fabric so that all the layers are joined. So in this method, which is the method we use a lot of the times, the lining fabric is quilted to the main fabric with soft and stable in between the layers to add body and stability. Binding the seams not only solves the problem of covering the raw edges that are formed when joining the pieces, but it also gives great structure and stability to the bag. However, this process does mean that I have to carefully consider how pieces are attached so as to minimize visible stitching lines when I add pockets, handles, and straps, and to prevent stitching lines in unwanted places when attaching the various pieces. So I thought I would show you some of the ways that we handle it. So this is a little back at you 2.1 backpack and it demonstrates um, several of the ways that we dealt with it. So on the bag front you have a pocket, underneath it are some credit card pockets or room key pockets and a magnetic flap. And then on the inside of that is a mesh pocket on the inside. So here's the way that goes together. So the first thing that we do is we take the piece of fabric for our bag back. We haven't yet shaped it. We don't do that until the end. And the first thing we're going to do is attach our flap and then we're going to attach a little facing that covers the raw edge on that seam. The next step is to attach our credit card pockets that are going to go underneath this outside pocket. And we do that one at a time. So the first one gets sewn on. We've marked lines to align them. The next one gets sewn on. The final one gets sewn on by sewing across the bottom and folding it up so you don't have any raw edges showing. And then you do some lines to create the sections in those. Once that is all done, your piece is going to look like this. And now we're ready to attach the pocket on the outside. So we've already prepared that by attaching our magnet, putting a facing over it, binding the top. We just lay that on top. It covers our pockets that are underneath, and then our flap will come down and close it. So we've got that all done, and the outside of our bag is done. Then we're going to flip that over, and we've got a mesh pocket that goes the full height of the bag that will sew on the inside. Because we sewed all of these before we attached the back pocket, we don't have to worry about any of the stitching lines on these impacting this pocket. And because we're only sewing around the outside edge of it, it's not going to impact any of the pockets on the exterior. On the back of the bag, we do things a little bit differently. So on that part of the bag, we have an inner slip pocket that's divided into two sections. So we have to do that first so that we can avoid the lines of stitching that attach this pocket from showing on the outside of the bag or going through the exterior pocket. So we're going to begin on this one on the lining side. 
and we're going to sew across the bottom of our pocket, bring it up, sew down the sides, and create our division. We had to put some really careful consideration into the placement of this pocket to ensure that these lines don't show on the outside and that ones that we do on the outside later don't go through this. So once that pocket is attached, which you can see we've got here on the back, we've created two divisions, then we're going to flip this back over and we're going to attach our straps and our padded handle to the exterior. And then our last step is to attach this um, back pocket. So it covers the raw edges of the handles and straps. And when we sew this in, we only sew on the outside edges. So even when we sew across here, you can see we're easily missing um, the pocket on the back. So you can see why the placement of this interior pocket was really important because we wouldn't want these lines of stitching to go through that pocket. So that's um, tips about back at you. Let's look next at um, Ultimate Travel because it's got a couple of other little things. So for on the Ultimate Travel, which is this bag right here, we go back and forth from the exterior to the interior as we work on the bag front. So we're going to start by, um, Jake, do you want this facing that way or towards me? Like it is? Fine. Okay. So the first thing that you're going to do is center your um, combination slip and zip pocket on the outside of the bag. And then you're going to attach handles, um, which are used to cover the raw edges of that and attach it to the bag. So you're going to do all that first. Once the front pocket and handles are sewn in place, then we're going to flip it over and attach the slip pocket that goes on the inside. And it looks like this. Because we, we don't want this to be just a great big pocket, we want to sew some divisions in it, but we want the outside of the bag to look as good as possible. We don't sew the divisions from this side. So we sew the pocket in from this side, and we're doing that while it's still a rectangle. And then we flip the piece over probably see it. Oh, I know you're not going to be able to see it easier there. But then we're going to stitch along the lines of stitching, the previous lines of stitching that are on the handles, and that's going to ensure that our stitching looks really good on the outside, and it's going to also create these lines of stitching on the inside. For the bag back, we again, on this one, we do all the sewing on the exterior, and then we flip it over and we attach a full height mesh pocket just as we did on back at you. So the stitching on that is just around the outside edges and all of it's going to be hidden when the bag is assembled. So as you can see from those examples, the really important consideration if you want to adapt somebody else's pattern is the order of assembly. You have to think about what stitching lines are going to be needed and then decide what you have to do first and whether the other piece will cover it. So one really easy way to um, attach an inner pocket is just to make a pocket that's large enough so that you can sew just around the outside edges as we did on this pocket in um, Ultimate Travel Bag and also in the back at you. That's usually a good solution. So when I wrote to Annie, I also suggested that she checks out our pattern for switchback. Because on this pattern, we came up with some unique ways of attaching pockets in order to solve some of the challenges of using quilted fabric rather than loose linings. Uh, we've got welt pockets. We've got pockets attached to the outside with facings. There's all kinds of different ways that we did this. This is a fairly involved project, but it's not really hard. It's just a lot of different techniques, and you really are going to learn a lot of new techniques when you work on this project. And the add-on video that goes with this has some really good tips for all of those techniques. So that's a pattern that I would recommend if you're looking at wanting to adapt other patterns because you'll learn some new techniques. All right, one more drink of water. And next I want to talk about glow and go. Where's my glow and go that goes with this? All right, so I want to talk about some alternatives for closing the straps on the wrap.
So Savrit wrote and said that she wanted to make a glow and go for a small child who was three to four years old. And she was concerned about whether they would be able to use this closure on the strap. So she asked if it would be possible to use a magnet on the strap for that project. And when I responded to Savrit, I told her I didn't really think that a magnet would be the best solution for this because this strap is designed so that when you put it through here, you can adjust it depending on what you've got inside. So if your, if your bag is empty, you know, it's going to not take, it's going to be, you can pull it tight. If you've got a lot of stuff in there, you can adjust it and it's going to accommodate thicker things. So you're going to have less showing over here. So trying to put a magnet on, either your strap would be too tight or it would be too loose. So I did suggest that if she did decide to go that route, one thing that she would also need to change is that she'd have to make the strap wider for the magnet to fit because our sew-in magnets are about an inch and a quarter wide. This strap is only an inch wide and you don't want the magnets hanging out over the edge. So um, you'd want to make a strap that's at least an inch and a half wide. As I told her, I thought a better alternative for closing the, mag, the bag might be to just use hook and loop tape on it. Um, some of you, if you're not sure what hook and loop tape is, it's, it's known as Velcro as well. So that would be really extra easy for lin little hands to open and close. The other thing I told Savrit though, is that I wouldn't necessarily rule out the slider because I'm often amazed at how dexterous my two grandsons who are three and six are. I really think that either one of them would be easily able to manage this slider. And I talked to my daughter-in-law and she said, oh yeah, they wouldn't have any problem with that. Because basically all that you're going to do is slide one side of the slider into here, go over the center post, pull it down, and then tighten it. You know, it takes a little bit of doing, but I have found that most kids really enjoy a challenge and it makes them feel really grown up when they master it. And they're often a lot more capable um, than what we think they will be. And I wanted to show you something that my grandson uh, made earlier this month. So he's six and um, I was busy with my sister working on some projects and so I needed something to keep him out of trouble. So I taught him how to do flip and sew crazy quilting. So I had him use a piece of soft and stable as the foundation and he just started putting on straps, put our strips, laying the other one over, he sewed pretty good accurate quarter inch seams and he even took it to the ironing board and ironed them flat and added the next piece. Because I was busy with my sister's project, um, I really wasn't there to help him at all, and he made this whole 8 by 10 inch piece on his, on his own. Since um, Liam and Glo left today to go to Spain to visit her family, I brought this to show you because I'm not going to ruin his surprise. So after he got that strip done, we just sewed it together on the long edge and then on the short sides. We boxed the ends, and now he's got a perfect little fun and colorful pincushion or paperweight that he can give his mom. He even did all the stitching on the bottom to close the bottom. I love the Franken stitching that he did, but he was so very proud of himself. And I know Glow is going to be thrilled when we open Gifts on Wiseman's Day and she finds this project that Liam made specifically for her. So, um, you know, count, count on them being able to do a lot more than you think and give them some challenges. All right, if you're just joining us today, we're sharing tips, tricks, and techniques. We're answering questions that have come in over the past month. We've talked about the features of soft and stable, measurements in biani patterns, adapting a pattern to use biani techniques, and alternatives for closing the glow and go wrap. Let's talk next about installing a zipper on a curved edge. So last week, we received an email from Jean who was making this hanging cosmetics organizer that's part of our travel essentials pattern. So Jean was stuck at the step of attaching the zipper to the body of this large quilted pocket that's at the bottom on the inside. And she said, how am I supposed to do that? Because here's what she was faced with. So she's got the bottom piece of her pocket that's big and she's got the lid with the zipper attached 
they're not the same measurements. And she said, how in the world am I going to align that? None of the sides are the same measurements. I can tell you that Jean is definitely not the first person who's been confused by this step. And so we actually filmed a video tutorial ages ago to explain that step. I'm going to walk through the steps today, but for future reference for you, to find that, you just need to go to um, our Zippers Are Easy video series. And to do that, you can just go to the tutorials link, scroll down till you see Zippers Are Easy, click on that link, and then scroll to where you see the pictures of the videos, and go over to part six of six, which is called Zippers on Curves, and you'll see exactly how to do that whole pocket. So let's just walk through them um, quickly today. So when you make that pocket, it starts as three rectangles of fabric. So there's one that makes the pocket at the bottom, there's one that makes the lid, and there's one that makes the base. So the first thing that you're going to do is round two of the corners on both the lid and the base. And the pattern instructs you to do that using a two and a half inch circle. And it's really important when you're doing this that you use a two and a half inch circle because the math of this has to equal the math of that and if you use a different size, you're not guaranteed that they're going to be the same. So I think what Jean was confused by was she was looking at this lid and she was looking at this straight length and realizing it didn't match her pocket. But actually what you're doing on this pocket, if you look again at the inside, is the zipper goes all the way around the lid. So it goes around the sides, the front, and then the other side. So I don't think she was considering that full length. So here's the secret to installing the zipper and then attaching it to the pocket. So the first thing you're going to do after you have your edges round, rounded is lay your zipper down on your um, quilted lid. And you want it, as we always do, to extend about an eighth of an inch beyond. You've got your right sides together. And you're going to let it hang off on each end. That's going to, having a zipper longer than you need is going to make it much easier when we go to put this together. So then I don't clip this in place. I just make sure I've got extra on, on each end. And I just start sewing and just kind of easing as I go around each of these corners. Once that's done, then I'm going to finger press my zipper to the inside of the pocket. And I'm going to stitch right along the very edge of the zipper tape. And when I'm done, it's going to look like this. So I've sewn, finger pressed down. I've pushed all my raw edges up under the edge of that zipper. And on these edges, on these corners, where I've got extra fabric, I'm just folding some little pleats into that. So there I've got my zipper installed in my lid. And now I'm ready to attach that to my pocket. And again, you're going to, it's going to be up here. This is going to be down here. But the trick to figuring out how to make this work is to fold your lid over so that your right sides are together and then turn it so that you've got this long edge of your lid even with the short edge of the pocket. And bring your zipper up to the top and let it extend about an eighth of an inch beyond at the top and put a clip on there. Then go over to the other side and line that long edge of the lid again up here. Let your zipper extend that little bit. Get it even on the edge. Put another clip there. Now, you could continue adding clips on there and try stitching around that with, um, you know, trying to deal with the curve. But here's a really easy tip. Open your zipper. which gets that out of the way. And you can see that our zipper is aligned just perfectly on there. And now we can sew along here with our quarter inch seam or our generous quarter inch seam and then finger press our zipper to the back. And then we've got our lid all assembled and it will be ready to attach to the, to the bag. So super simple and easy to do. Um, if you've not, uh, if you've struggled with that, make sure you go check out that video or watch this Facebook Live again. Uh, it's really an easy project to do. 
So, we've made it through lots of tips and techniques for one week. Um, I can definitely tell that everyone has been really extra busy sewing gifts because we have had so many emails over the past couple weeks. I hope the explanations we covered today have been helpful to you and you've picked up some good tips and techniques for your next project. Trevor asked, can you show a close-up of the cellulite on the fabric? I thought you were going to say on my hips, and it's like, ah, uh, no, but I can on the fabric. Jake, can you? Uh, right, right here. Okay. So it shows up better on the light colored side than it does on the dark colored side, but I'll pr pull that, turn it over, and you can see the other side too. So this has been washed once. And the thing that I found is this happens after washing, this happens after just turning your bag inside out as things start to separate. It also happens as you carry a bag. So that's part of the reason why we totally avoid fusibles and stick with just the sew-in um, batting. If you look at this one, so here it is made with just the soft and stable. You can see the difference there. When I pull on this, you can see the fabric is not the fabric is not attached to the soft and stable at all, but when I let go of it, it's almost like a magnet and it pulls, pulls it back into place. Should I flip it over and show the other side too? Can you pick up the wrinkles well enough? So that's that. The other question Trevor posted is, does Annie still teach classes at quilt shops? I have said um, no to any requests that have come in um, over the past several months. COVID kind of messed with things. That happened about at the same time that we had lots of staffing changes here and a new accounting system. And I realized that if I was gonna get anything done, I needed to be here, not traveling around the country. I've also, um, with this weekly Facebook Live, it makes it really hard. So, so far I am saying, no to any requests for teaching, um, but hopefully if you've got something that you want to learn, your local shop um, can have classes and definitely uh, check with them uh, to see about doing that. All right, so thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here and all of your support that you've given us over the past year. It's really hard to believe that this year is almost over and we have almost a full year of Facebook Lives under our belt. So thank you so much for making them so much fun. As we mentioned last week, we are going to have some holiday closures this month. So I want to remind everybody about those so you can be prepared uh, to thank all our hardworking staff for their amazing effort this past year. We're giving everyone an extra week off at the end of the year. So Biani is going to be closed from December 24th through January 2nd. So from Friday all the way to Sunday, two Sundays from then. Um, you'll still be able to access our website. You'll still be able to place orders. We're still planning to have a Live with Annie next week that we're pre-recording, but we are not going to be on hand to answer calls or emails, and we are not going to be filling any orders during that time. So as always, we recommend that you check with your local quilt shop if you need supplies during that time, or make sure you get your orders in early, like today. So tomorrow's our last day that we'll be shipping until January 3rd when we return, and we'll be very busy that day, and probably for more than a day. So let's move on now to our local quilt shop of the week feature. Each February we host a local quilt shop contest and during that contest we encourage sewists to vote for their favorite quilt shop and tell us a little bit about what makes them special. To continue the fun and support of those local businesses throughout the year, each week we highlight a store and some of their voter submissions during Live with Annie. This week we are featuring Prairie Quilt Inc. of Hennessy, Oklahoma, who recently celebrated their 20th anniversary. Owned by Randa Parrish, Prairie Quilt is the largest privately owned quilt shop in Oklahoma and was recently chosen as one of the top 10 shops in the nation by Quilt Sampler magazine. The store is in a hundred-year-old historic building in the heart of downtown Hennessy, which is about an hour north of Oklahoma City. 
The store has recently expanded to over 10,000 square feet, jam-packed with over 5,000 bolts of quilting fabrics, notions, and kits. They are also proud dealers of Faf, Brother, and Handy Quilter sewing, embroidery, and quilting machines. Prairie Quilt focuses on education and offers all types of classes, from beginners and children's classes to complex paper piecing and machine embroidery. And Randa and her team go live on Facebook to share new products, fun demos, and special sales at least three days a week. As Randa says, our main building is two stories full of nonstop sewing, embroidering, and quilting fun. We'll put up the links to their website and social media so that you can join in the fun. We recently shipped a trunk show to Prairie Quilt, which will be on display soon, so be sure to stop by and tell them that Annie sent you. Customers raved about the friendliness and helpfulness of the staff at Prairie Quilt and the owner, as well as the store's fabulous selection. Mary said that going into Prairie Quilt is like going to a quilt show. There are lots of samples, fabrics, kits, great service, and fun machines. When asked what makes the store stand out, Tony said, the employees. They are very personable and knowledgeable and always willing to help. Tony also recognized Randa's commitment to education in classes, saying, if only one person signs up for a class, Randa makes sure that the class is held, and the shop owner herself will sit down and help you with anything you need. Nancy summed it up saying what stands out to her are the staff, the staff, the staff, and great stuff. And oh yes, did I mention the great staff they have there? It is really obvious that Randa and all of her team at Prairie Quilt love what they do and that their customers love them in return. We thank them for their helpfulness, friendliness, and their dedication to helping others express their creativity through sewing. And we want to say thank you to all of you for joining us this week. And to do that, we have some fun prizes. So two lucky winners are going to receive the just-in-case pattern and a half-yard package of Soft and Stable. So that's enough Soft and Stable to make both the small and the large case. And remember that Soft and Stable comes in both black or white, um, so be sure to let Trevor know the color you prefer when he reaches out to let you know that you are the winner. And here's what you need to do to win. And remember that you need to do this on Facebook. We haven't figured out a way to make it work on YouTube. So first, leave us a comment. Tell us something you learned in today's presentation. Uh, maybe which of the Biani patterns that we showed today you'd like to make next. Have you adapted any patterns by other designers to use Biani techniques? Are you finished with your holiday sewing or still hard at it? And do you have any tips to share? We always love to hear from you, so please share a comment with us. Second, we ask that you tag a friend because we really want to spread the word about our weekly Facebook Lives. And so please share this with someone who you think would enjoy them. And to do that, all you need to do is type the at symbol followed by the name that they use on Facebook, a picture of them and their name will pop up so you can make sure you've got the right person. If so, click on that, add your comment, and then submit it. We are going to pick winners from comments made by Midnight Mountain Time tonight, so you have a little over nine more hours to watch and comment. And then finally, remember to check your Facebook messages. Trevor's going to notify our winners and ask you to email us your shipping address, and you can let him know then if you have a preference for your soft and stable color. So thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We're going to be back next week at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with a really special year-end episode of Live with Annie. We'll be closed, so it will be pre-recorded, but it's going to be lots of fun, so don't miss it. Until then, happy stitching. <laughs>